I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. I'm Brian DiDonato. Good morning. It is 9.06, Wednesday, September 30th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I can promise less interrupting today than whatever that was last night. I'm Bill Finley from the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I want to say on that point, we've agreed beforehand, each of us gets to talk for two minutes. There'll be no interruption. Wait, Bill, I want to interrupt you right now, Bill. On there your we go. Already a, a blank, blank show. Okay, there we go. Thanks, John. Jonathan Green, DJ's Table General Manager, and just proud to be here. Uh, Brian Dean, now a racing editor at the TDN and managing partner of Franklin Ave Equine. And apologies, I'm still a little hungover from last night, so I, I hope I'm okay for this. Yeah, for, for those of our, our international viewers and listeners, this is even way worse for us than it even looked on TV last <laughs> night for you. This was like... This was like two of your drunk uncles screaming at each other for two hours at Thanksgiving dinner, and you feel like you're caught in the middle. So that's where we are now. <laughs> Welcome to the TDN Writers Room. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The Keeneland Fall Meet begins Friday, October 2nd, and continues through Saturday, October 24th. Watch, wager, and win on all the action with Keeneland Select. Sign up for a new account and receive a special $50 back after you wager $100 on Keeneland Racing this October. This is on top of Keeneland Select's lucrative sign-up bonus that will earn you $100 back after you wager $300 in the first 30 days. Also, last week, Keeneland's September wrapped up, sold over 4,000 yearlings, at least went through the ring. Obviously, a huge undertaking with all the, the digital components and the online betting. So congrats to everybody at Keeneland for uh, pretty much going off, for going off without a hitch. And I know Brian is interested in the Keeneland digital sale, which will go on tomorrow, October 1st. Yeah, um, we've got a horse in the sale, hip 5005, uh, Moonshine Dancing is her name, Spitester Philly, who won first out um, a couple Sundays ago. Um, you know, kind of a ready-made racehorse. I uh, think she'll be a useful horse for somebody, and uh, there's room for improvement. We'll be in the digital sales ring along with, I think, 60-something other uh, horses of racing age. Um, so we look forward to that as well. And that leads right into the Keeneland Fall Meet starting this Friday. So we had some legislative news in the racing world yesterday with the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act passing the U.S. House yesterday via a voice vote. Uh, the, the vote happened a little bit earlier than everyone expected. There were no objections, though. Um, so it, it pretty much sailed through the House. Uh, before we get into the implications of it, uh, Paul Tonko of New York and Andy Barr of Kentucky put a ton of work into getting this passed through the House. They've been doing it for years, and everybody in that office deserves a lot of credit for getting to this point to where it seems as though the vast majority of the industry is on board with this. Um, we talked about it before, uh, about the, the USADA um, component where they we're going to have an independent, outside, third-party drug testing agency to help us um, with our, 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 our medication policies. It seems like it's going to pass the House, the Senate rather, pretty easily. Uh, there's no guarantee yet that it's going to be brought up before the end of this legislative term, but with Mitch McConnell behind it, you got to think he's going to bring it up to a vote. And it seems like a, a truly bipartisan bill. So I think it went from 2% on Bill's favorite website, GovTrack, to probably like 99% now. Um, so just a remarkable turnaround. Um, and I think everybody that, that that's worked on it and has done the behind the scenes lifting deserves a lot of credit um, but I'll toss it over to Bill and, and whether or not he has any any new impression. Well there isn't really anything new to say about this I mean what happened in the house yesterday was what everybody expected to happen and now it's a it's a hundred percent Joe we'll go to gov tracker and we'll see if they give it a hundred percent but it is a hundred percent now it's going to sail through uh, the, the senate whenever they get to it and just kind of going back to what this is all about uh, before March 9th, I was a little bit on the fence about this bill and whether or not this was a good thing for the industry. Then when all those indictments came down, I went 100% in favor for it because what happened was we knew, that we already knew, but we knew even more so that this sport cannot police itself, that it's failed to do so for 100 years or so, and uh, the bad guys were running amok. 
And there's got to be a better way. And we'll find out how this all works. But I think the better way is USADA. And to me, that's what this bill is all about. The other sort of, you know, little minor things about LASIKs regulations and, and uniform standards. So they have the same racing rules in New Mexico that they have in, um, you know, wherever, t- Texas or something like that. I don't really care about that stuff. USADA's coming to town and let's see what happens with them. And can they really clean up the game? I think that they uh, have a big uh, task in front of them, but they've got to be better than what we've been doing all these years. Absolutely. And, and you know, the one question that we ask are the trainers who come on as guests of the week is how would you fix racing? If you were czar for a day, what would you do? And almost across the board, 100%, they all said, we need to have a medication regulatory group. Um, and whether it's a third party or it's, or it's independent or it's somebody in-house, it almost doesn't matter. But we needed to have a regulatory board that had some teeth to them um, and also to make the rules uniform um, across you know, most of the racing jurisdictions. And you know, a lot of trainers will tell you that that's one of the hardest things to figure out isn't whether a horse is going to win or not run well in a certain race but rather trying to work backwards from that race and say, okay, 14 days in advance, I need to discontinue this uh, medication. 30 days in advance, I need to discontinue this uh, policy that that I'm implementing on the horse. So it really is difficult um, for trainers, especially ones that tip out a lot to various racetracks um, and racing jurisdictions to, you know, figure it all out. And and their, their jobs are tough enough as it is. So to have a uniform group come in and at least give us some kind of rules and, and regulations standard for across the industry, I think is what everybody in the business wants um, and needs. I'd echo, you know, I really Bill's sentiments. Um, I'm always a little hesitant. You know, you could definitely see how this is going to get screwed up in other ways, um, but something needs to be done in racing. And at this point, if it's, even if it's a Hail Mary, even if it's our last shot, I think clearly we have some serious issues in racing that need to be fixed. And, at least we're, you know, at least it's something. What do you think that will get screwed up? I don't know. I mean, we, I don't know. Maybe somebody knows how we're going to pay for it. Um, I don't know. Just, you know, as we saw last night, government can be iffy sometimes. <laughs> I don't know how else to say, it, but we'll see. I mean, we'll see. The f- it can't be worse. Let's put it that way. Maybe it can. Yeah. Famous last words. <laughs> yeah. Brian, as, as an owner, Brian, if, if they were implement some kind of a tax on, um, you know, on our purse money. In other words, if in, instead of getting $400 for finishing last in a race, um, you know, somebody gets $200 instead, and that money goes towards the testing for the entire race. Is that a possibility where you would be in favor of it? Uh, I mean, the problem is the economics of ownership are already so brutal and the economics of betting are already so brutal. So that. I don't know where it's supposed to come from. It needs to come from somewhere. It would help if our business was a little better and we were bringing in more money in general. Um, I mean, I guess it's going to have to come from somewhere. Maybe the, maybe the owners will foot the bill. Well, here's, here's my argument, it, and, and it's not towards you necessarily, but, but just as right. a fellow owner, that's why I was asking you. Mm-hmm. So if you knew that you were going to go into a race and you opened the racing form and you saw, I'm going to use Navarro as a name, okay, because he's already implemented. You see Jorge Navarro has the four to five shot in the race. You know you're running for second place money, okay? Probably now all of a sudden the industry has cleaned itself up miraculously, and there are no more Navarros in the race. Well, now you actually have a chance to win. So your possibility, instead of running for a 20% part of the purse, is going to you legitimately now have a shot at getting the 60%. So your economics are going to be better because we're getting rid of some of the cheaters out of the industry, which means that honest guys like your operation, my operation, and other organizations that, that do things the right way now have a chance to make more money. So is it worth a couple hundred dollars a race that we have to give up um, because the upside is, is higher? I think that's, that's the yeah. way they're going to pay for it. I can see that. I, I think that makes sense. I want to add something to that while we're on this subject. And look, as, as someone who's come out and said, you know, you saw it is going to be better than what we have, and that's why we should do it. This is not the perfect solution to this problem. There is still going to be cheating. I mean, you're never going to stop people from wanting to cheat. I just think they'll do a better job 
of policing the sport than we've been doing now. There are still going to be the Jorge Navarros of the world. Let's just hope that they can catch them. And, you know, again, what one thing I'd like to hear more from them is what tools they're going to use. We know that right now our system of drug testing is inadequate. Are they going to do a lot of more investigative work, boots on the ground, that sort of thing, like some of the things that led to the indictments of Navarro Service and the others. But, but John, I understand what you're saying to Brian, but let's not assume and again, this is coming from somebody who's in favor of this, that the day USADA comes in, the game is going to be 100% honest with nobody cheating. That's never going to happen. Absolutely. Anytime there's any competition of any kind, um, people are going to look to, to push the envelope and skirt the rules, whether it's horse racing or baseball or, or, you know, or business in general. So you're right. I mean, human nature is as, as such that if there's a, 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 a gain to be made and you know, people are going to look to take an edge. Um, but what I'm hoping in, in my sincerity of a heart of hearts is that um, this new legislation is going to come in and at least make it more difficult and, you know, to cheat. And if you're caught, it's going to be much more of an onerous penalty um, rather than just the kind of slap on the wrist that we have in, in the current uh, program. Well, the main thing, the main thing is getting the, the regulatory responsibility out of the sport. Because, I mean, that, that, that's the case, I think, a lot of times in government is when stuff actually get, gets fixed, there's a third party watchdog that is, that is enlisted to come in and, and kind of clean up whatever business we're talking about. I think that's the main thing. And whether or not that actually happens and whether or not it really has teeth, I think, is going to be the, the, main, the, the main determining factor of whether or not this is more successful than our current system. But like you guys said, it can't, it can't be worse. And there still are a lot of cheaters to catch, you know, just because we got Navarro in service and, and a couple of low level veterinarians doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that we've cleaned up the sport. I mean, hopefully there'll be more indictments to come from that. But, you, I mean, you guys know we talk about it like off camera and through text when, when somebody's having like a ridiculous weekend and all these horses are jumping off the page with their performances. Like we know, we know who they are and we, more or less, you know, there's, there's a handful of guys even at the top of the game that, you know, you have major suspicions about. And, you know, I think like you, like John said, you're never going to hundred percent clean up the game and, and get cheating out of the sport, but we can do a hell of a lot better than we're doing now. And I think we are on that path. Uh, we're going to hopefully we get more details um, when the Senate bill comes to the floor. I think there's some stuff that even though there's companion legislation, there's some stuff that the Senate bill will have that will be a little bit different. And then once it actually passes into law, um, see if whoever the president is signs it, then we'll, I think we can have like a real breakdown line by line of, of what this means for the industry. But for now, at least it seems on the path to passage. Uh, so thankfully, Santa Anita was able to open last weekend. We had uh, we had some concern about the wildfires out there and whether or not that was going to further delay the start of the meet. With, it already, already was delayed a, a week and some training days got canceled. Nevertheless, they were able to conduct opening weekend. Hopefully they can be smooth through the rest of the meet. Um, I think the, uh, the by far the most impressive performance of the weekend was improbable in the awesome again dusting his stable mate maximum security now he did get a good setup they went 23 46 109 and he was he was detached from the field the other four were pretty much close to each other up on that pace so he did get the right setup he only had to make that one run but it was a pretty devastating run and and he could have won by more got a 108 buyer probably could have been a couple points higher if he had been fully extended but i think it's he's an interesting horse because he's gone from i think completely forgotten in the first half or so of the year to now, I think is the clear leader in the handicap division. Now you can say what you want about Taj Zeta. Obviously maximum security has the Saudi cup win and the Pacific classic win, but in terms of finishing out the year, I think it's clear that improbable is now the leader in the pack. He had the gold cup win earlier this year at Santa Anita. He had the really impressive Whitney win. And then he has the, the awesome again, win over the weekend. I think it'll be interesting to see who goes favored in the classic you know, Tis the law is going to take a lot of support. Maximum security is going to take a lot of support. But um, if improbable is, you know, five to two or better, I, I, I would take him. I would bet him in the classic. I just think he has developed into the lead dog in this division. And I think, uh, you know, he's, he's going to take the beating for sure. Um, so it was pretty interesting to have to see Princess Nora also get another 70, 78 buyer in the chandelier. Obviously, she's incredibly talented, but I've, I've just never seen a horse – we have three blowout wins with buyers in the seventies at top level competition like that. It's, it's a pretty interesting thing. And if she's, uh, if she's four to five or so in the, in the juvenile Phillies, I don't know if she'll be that short, but she's probably gonna be really short price. 
a juvenile Phillies. I don't know. I would be inclined to take a shot against her. Um, we had United in the John Henry turf, who has become like a pretty hard knocking uh, turf marathoner, if you want to say that for Richard Mandela. Um, mucho unusual in, in the Rodeo Drive. I feel like that's a race that's kind of overdue for a downgrade. It's kind of had some some grade two, grade three winners win it in the last couple of years. Um, Belmont at the, at, in the Vosburg, we had Forenze Fire, who's always run well at Belmont. Uh, CZ Rocket in the San Diego Sprint Championship, a reclamation project by Peter Miller that seems to be uh, going pretty well, unexpectedly, uh, or maybe expectedly. Uh, but yeah, most of the action was at San Anita. We're going to get into this weekend's action in a little bit, but uh, some kind of some kind of response from the uh, from the rest of the crew on this weekend's action. Well, I mean, obviously the big story, as you mentioned, Joe, is improbable. And I think, you know, we've kind of hinted at this uh, among the writers room before and a lot of people in, in racing in general, that he might be the best horse in the country. We didn't really know and he had to prove more, but I'm with you. I, I don't think there's any doubt right now. And that obviously could change in the Breeders' Cup Classic. But, you know, this was a showdown between the really the number one and number two, uh, or maybe the number one and number three in the older horse division with improbable winning over maximum security and clearly number one. Um, the, uh, there's also the possibility now if Authentic, and we'll talk about that later, wins the Preakness, would Baffert perhaps have the first three favorites in the Breeders' Cup Classic in um, maximum security who a lot of people will give another chance, Authentic and Improbable. I think the only horse in there that might get into there, into the mix is, is, is the law. But this is a really good horse right now. And uh, obviously, like you said, he's kind of come from nowhere. It, it was not only uh, a win, it was an authoritative win where he left nothing to doubt. And I think want, if people want to jump in this, I, I'd like to hear other people's opinion. Was maximum security bad or was Improbable just that good? Yeah, it's an interesting point, Bill. I mean, it, it may be not to not to be uh, you know to be milk toast about it, but it could be a little bit of both. Um, just that the one horse just is really hitting a stride and starting to peak, and maximum security, you know, maybe needed maybe needed a, a race and, and bounced a little bit. Um, the Santa Anita race that I actually wanted to talk about a little bit more detail actually was the Zenyatta, um, and that's because Harvest Moon, a three-year-old, not only beat older fillies. Um, but did it really impressively. Didn't have a you know a chance to really get take a breather when the favorite Fighting Mad you know was going kind of tooth and nail and, and nip and tuck with Harvest Moon, and then uh, the Uncle Mo Philly just went on and and won uh, you know starting to pull away and 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 kind of easily. But it's really impressive when a three year old beats older mares this time of year because um, you know you're you're trying to project what horses are going to do come the classics and, you know, the Breeders' Cup races and, and into their four-year-old year. Um, and there's such a huge maturation jump from three to four years old. So to see a filly that can do that and beat all their fillies um, and wasn't even the favorite or the second choice was the third choice in the race, um, you know, according to the odds. And, uh, and, and one, what I thought was, a, was an impressive move for a three-year-old filly. Um, by the way, Uncle Mo had two graded stake winners over the weekend. So he is starting to come back as a, as a top sire. Not that we ever forgot about Uncle Mo, but, um, you know, he's really doing well. And he's got some sons now that are also showing that they, uh, they can do daddy proud as far as being, uh, you know, sires as well. Yeah. And I think those two graded winners came within, they were very close together, you know, so that was, a, that's always cool when a sire can do that. And I think he had a nice maiden winner on Sunday as well. Um, that was actually the horse I was going to bring up. I thought Harvest Moon was very impressive. Um, I think she got a 97 or 98 buyer, which isn't really far off from what Monomoy Girl's been running. Um, so I would think she's obviously got the upside. I would think she's an interesting one. Maybe not bat battle tested yet. I mean, it was, what, a five-horse field. Um, but she beat some legitimately good horses and accomplished horses. And if she can step forward from that at all, I think she'll be you know, pretty competitive in the Breeders' Cup. Um, back to maximum security and probable. Maximum security is just a tricky horse. I mean, his breezes for this weren't – weren't particularly good um, that I had to, having to catch on XBTV. Um, you were kind of waiting for a performance like this from him, but Improbable obviously also just dominated. Um, I mean, I don't know how you could bet maximum security with much confidence in the classic. Um, and I don't know how short of a price he'll be. I, I mean, obviously he's a big name, but there are a lot of, there are going to be a lot of big names in that race. Uh, but, you know, like everyone said, Improbable is certainly the leader of the division right now. 
So looking forward to this weekend. Obviously, we have, we have the Preakness, which I'll get into, but I just wanted to run down some of the other stuff that's going on this weekend. Uh, obviously, Keeneland opens on Friday, which which we touched on at the beginning of the show. Uh, they start Friday with the, the Alcibiades and the uh, Phoenix Stakes. So they're both, those are both winning your ends for the Breeders' Cup. Uh, Saturday, we got the Belmont Derby at Belmont, along with the Joe Hurst Turf Classic, as well as the Kelso and the Pilgrim. So a big turf day of stakes uh, at Belmont. And then Keeneland obviously has their, their big opening weekend with the Breeders' Futurity, the First Lady, the Shadwell Turf Mile, the Thoroughbred Club of America Stakes, all winning your ends for the Breeders' Cup, as well as the Woodford. Um, and then obviously the Pimlico undercard as well. Sunday is a big day. Usually most of the, the stakes action is concentrated on Saturday, but Sunday we have the Bell Dame, the Belmont Turf Sprint, the Miss Grillo, and the uh, – and the, uh, those are the stakes at, at Belmont. And then we have the Bourbon and the Judmont Spinster and the Indian Summer at, at Keeneland. Again, all Breeders' Cup winning year ends. Um, but obviously the main event of the weekend is the Preakness and the Preakness undercard at Pimlico. Uh, it's just so weird in the first week of October to be getting ready for the Preakness. It's not just everything's so discombobulated. But uh, we have an 11-horse field. We had authentic draw the nine-hole um, to uh, rather – our collector will take Tis the Law's place probably as the, as the second choice from the three hole. Um, if you guys want to splash up the graphic, we have this. It's all come down to this in the TDN Derby Fantasy Contest between me and Al, um, 530 to 528. I lead by a, a slim two points. I've got Art Collector going Saturday um, against his authentic. Uh, obviously, the suspense is killing all of you, I'm sure. Um, but it's been it's been fun along the way. It was a good idea by Brian to do the fantasy draft. It's really kept it a little bit interesting through this seemingly endless three-year-old season. Um, but here we are with the last leg of the Triple Crown. Uh, I wanted to toss it over to Bill and get your guys' initial impressions of the Preakness field. And we obviously wish Tis the Law was in there. would have made it a better race. But it's not a bad race, especially considering – everything that's gone on this year. I guess the storyline or the headline coming in is can Authentic do it again? Um, I don't see any reason to really dislike him, um, uh, but he's going to be favored this time. I'll try to pick against him. I guess Art Collector would be the horse to go for to, uh, you know, if you're, you just don't want to land on the favorite. From a betting standpoint, I'm not really all that excited about the race. Uh, and, you know, again, it, it, it's sort of just the end of a, a very, very strange year of Preakness in October. But if Authentic steps up and wins, one thing I think that will happen is I think that he will, and again, I'll, I'll throw this open to the panel, see if anybody disagrees with me. I think he clinches the three-year-old championship if he wins this race. And, you know, we were, we were talking six weeks ago, nobody would have given, uh, what odds would you have given that Tis the Law was not going to be the three-year-old champion? And as I mentioned in an earlier writer's room, I mean, they're taking a risk here by not running in the Preakness of, you know, foregoing the chance to win the three-year-old championship. Now, of course, that could all change in the Breeders' Cup Classic if Tisla Law would come back or, or, or a three-year-old would win it. But I, I think most of us are in agreement that the older horses are so good this year, it's going to be hard for a three-year-old to win the Breeders' Cup Classic. Yeah, and, and Bill, with that in mind, I really think, uh, you know, almost irrespective of what happens this weekend in the Preakness, it's going to come down to what Authentic and Tis the Law, you know, do in the Breeders' Cup weekend as to ultimately who's going to, you know, push the other one uh, or, or push ahead of the other one. Um, but you're absolutely right. We would not have been even dreaming about this a couple of months ago um, that, that anyone would still be within, you know, sniffing distance of, of Tis the Law with regard to three-year-old horse of the year. Um you know, with regard to the contest, I am going to pledge my points to Brian DiDonato since he was so against the supplemental group that I'm going to pledge my 20 plus points to him oh, um, nice. with the idea that that might get him into uh, into you know win place or show position. Am I well? If how far back am I in third? Because I have two horses and I can run one too. And you could. Uh, you're, not, uh, you're, you're the you're, sneaky you're, underdog in all this, Brian. Uh, maybe maybe technically you could win. Yeah, exactly. I, see, I think I, that's my exacta. So, <laughs> betting enough. it in real life, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna run you two down. So, there's just a couple of the horses that I want to mention for the Preakness um, that haven't been discussed. First of all, um, thousand words. I mean, if he is ultimately over his pre-race issues, um, you know, is he a legitimate candidate? I think so, absolutely. I mean, he he's still you know, sports one of the 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 triple digits. Uh, you know, in the race, he had a 104 buyer after the shared belief. Um, they're putting blinkers on them, and if they can kind of calm him down and make sure he doesn't run roughshod over over people, um, you know, in the paddock and, and the pre-race, um, I think he's got a legitimate shot. And how about Swiss Skydiver? I mean, again, what, you know, I, I give uh, McPeak 
a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, credit because of his chutzpah for running the Philly in the Preakness when she probably would have been hands down the favorite, um, you know, in the Black Eyed Susan, which is also a huge race for your resume. So the fact that he's, you know, shifting her over to, to run against the boys in the Preakness, um, I think you have to give him and, and the connections uh, involved with Swiss Skydiver uh, a lot of credit. So, uh, you know, I'm interested to see how those two wild card horses run. Um, the wild card one being thousand words pre-race and, and the wild card two being can Swiss Skydiver, you know, win one of the classic races against the boys? Yeah, um, I'm way against authentic. I might end up being wrong, but he was just so cranked for that derby. If you look at his work pattern, I mean, he was he worked like a mile one time. I, mean, I think he was 100% cranked for that race. Now to come back in a few weeks, I think it's just a little bit of a tough task, especially when you add it in the pace scenario. It looks like there's a ton of speed. Um, he's going to have to work out a different kind of trip. Art Collector is the obvious alternative. I've just, I don't know what it is about him. I've just never been totally sold on him. Um, he could obviously do it, but don't buy it. So like I said, uh, I'm going to go with a Max Player pneumatic exacta. I kind of, I actually really like, like uh, Max Player. He was on the bad part of the track for a good chunk of that race and made a legitimate run. And one of these days he's going to get one of these meltdown paces that he probably needs. And I think there's a decent chance that could happen in this race. Uh, just a couple things I wanted to touch on. It's it's funny what Bill said, how there's not really anything not to like about Authentic. We went from finding every <laughs> single reason possible not to like him going into the Derby, to now it's like, well, he's got no knocks. He's a perfect racehorse. We, we um, didn't even hardly mention him last time. I mean, it was like an afterthought. Yeah. It was like, okay, we went through all these other 17 other horses. Oh, yeah, what about Authentic? And then proceeded to dump on him for five minutes. <laughs> um, but I, I agree with Brian's point about the pace. It does look like there is at least, if not a lot of speed, a lot of horses who want to be up close. Um, so I think that the idea that, that authentic is going to get his way the way he did in the, in the Derby, probably not going to happen. I know why Brian doesn't like our collector because he was my simple metal pick and helped me overtake Brian's mm -hmm. longstanding yeah. lead in the contest. So that's definitely why, because he's biased and that's why he has a max player pneumatic exacta. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe this will be the new Harvey's little Goyle. He'll, he'll show me up next week about that. Uh, but yeah, I think if you want to, if you want to get a little funky and a little cute here, I think the, the idea should be to get one of the off the pace closers into the number. I think, uh, excessive is a little, or section accession rather is a little interesting from the rail. Um, he only has that one big race, but he was second at 82 to one in the rebel. He was beaten less than a length by Nadal. Obviously got a fast pace to run into that day. Maybe he'll get another fast pace to run into this time, but I think it's an interesting spot. Hard, hard, hard to see him winning off of such a long layup. He hasn't run since the Rebel, which was March 14th. Um, so that's almost seven months that he's been off. But Chris have been working well for Steve Asmussen, and I think he could he could be a, a long shot to get in the number. Has a local jockey in Sheldon Russell, which is always an uh, always a angle I like in the Preakness. It is a little bit of a funky track in Pimlico. I think it's 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 pretty it, it's it's good to have a, a local rider if, if you want to get that kind of long shot. Um, I, there's, there's been a bunch of long shots over the years that have gotten in the money, local horses. Um, this is not a local horse, but a local rider at least. But yeah, Mr. Big News, I think for John is, is not out of the realm of possibility either if we do get a total pace meltdown. Um, so yeah, we, so John has representation in here. Uh, Bill has representation with New York traffic. Um, I, I know John is still broken up about the, the Paco Lopez ride, but he's got Horatio Caramanos on now. And I don't know if John is familiar with him, but He's well, probably, yeah, we, yeah, Carmanos wins a bunch of races for us. How about how about Paco jumping ship off of New York traffic onto Max Player? Yeah. Or was well, he thrown yeah, off that, New York traffic? <laughs> I don't think that's the right kind of horse for him, that kind of one-run closer. I think you got to be able – Paco needs a horse that he can use to pinball other horses out of the way in the first furlong. Like, that's his ideal mount. Um, but, yeah, so Brian has pneumatic and, and Max Player. Uh, Al has authentic as well as Thousand Words. I'm stuck with just Art Collector. Um, so at least – at least all four of us had some kind of representation or all five of us rather have some kind of representation in the Preakness. So look forward to it. It's been a wild triple crown. Um, I'm not sure that, that authentic is going to wrap up the three year old championship. If he wins the Preakness, I think a lot of it will depend on what happens in the classic with Tesla law, but yeah, it's a super, super quick turnaround in that division for sure. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland.
The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we're going in-house this week for The Green Group Guest of the Week and someone who I'm always surprised doesn't have a British accent because of how well she covers Euroland for the TDN. It's the TDN International Editor, Kelsey Riley. Welcome, Kelsey. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here to talk about my favorite race and also my favorite day of racing of the whole year. For sure. Yeah. So this weekend is ARC weekend. We have the ARC to Triumph on Sunday. So we wanted to get Kelsey on and get some of her thoughts and then transition into a, a more regular role for Kelsey on the show. So we're glad to welcome her aboard. Uh, I guess I'll start with this. Um, it's an interesting race because you have two Phillies or a Philly and a mayor who are really going to dominate the betting and enable in love. Uh, is there anybody else in the race that you can see sneaking in to beat those two? Or do you think it really is a two horse race? Oh, no, it's uh, it's very much an open race. And the the major development this week has been the rain that's been falling in Paris. Um, so right now, the track in Longchamp is listed as very soft, which is the same as what it was last year uh, when, Enable, when Enable ran second. And, uh, and there's more rain still forecast to come. So that's sort of opened things up a little bit more. And it's not that the soft going hurts Enable. It certainly doesn't. She's, she's known to go on that surface, but it opens it up to, uh, to a few more possibilities. So you have a horse like Stradivarius, who is, he's been the best stayer in Europe for uh, the past couple seasons. One, basically every group one and, and major race over a route of ground that they have over there, uh, three gold cups, seven group ones in total. And, uh, you know, he's won every big staying race. So what they've decided to do with him at this point is to try and uh, shorten him up to a mile and a half, uh, if you will. And, uh, and, and go for this most important race in Europe. So, you know, I think that the soft going will, uh, will help his chances a bit. Um, it'll turn it into a bit more of a stamina contest. So Stradivarius shortened up to um, a mile and a half earlier this year to be uh, third in the coronation stakes. And then he went back out and won two more big staying races. And then he shortened back up again in his first trip to Paris last time out and ran a very good second to Anthony Van Dyke, who was last year's Derby winner, um, over the good ground. And, and so, yeah, this, this soft ground that we're seeing is going to help, um, you know, see his stamina come out into play. And it was, it was kind of, it might turn into a situation that we saw last year in the race where we had Waldgeist, who was, uh, you know, a proper mile and a half horse. He wanted every inch of that distance. And, uh, and the soft ground that we saw really helped play to his strengths. And he was able to overhaul and able who, who ran a winning race herself, but he was able to overhaul her in the last few strides, you know, because of that. Um, so Stradivarius is, uh, is definitely one, a horse that has uh, seen a bit of money come in, in the last couple of days is Sot Sass, who is Peter Brandt's um, four year old uh, half brother to sister Charlie actually. And uh, he was third in last year's arc as a three-year-old, um, again, over this same soft going, uh, ran a very game race there. And uh, he's, he, he's won a, a group one over in France earlier this year, but he's really, he's taken a bit of time to come, you know, back to his full stride this year. And uh, however, his trainer, Jean-Claude Rouget, has, uh, has spoken very, very highly of him this week. Coming into it says that he has him as the best that he's ever had him. And they have certainly, they've had this as their key target ever since he finished third last year. Um, and another horse that I find a little bit interesting is actually Jean-Claude Rouget's other horse, which is actually the uh, other three-year-old filly in the race, um, aside from love, uh, which is a filly called Rabaha, which is owned by Sheikh Hamdan. And uh, she was very impressive winning her first two starts this spring. And Jean-Claude, um, you know, right from that point was saying, this is our arc filly. Yeah, so Rabaha was fourth in the Prix de Dion. Um, she had a bit of a wide trip, uh, not much cover. Uh, you know, it wasn't an ideal race for her. But the thing that I liked about that was when she kind of got squeezed between some fillies in the last couple furlongs and she really, she really re-rallied and, uh, 
She came back um, after a bit of a break this summer and won a group three uh, very nicely. She was second in the Prix Vermeil on the ARC Trials card, um, but you know, ran another good race and, and, and just like Love, she gets that, she gets that weight break. She is untested on this kind of ground, um, but she's by See the Stars, who's also the sire of uh, Stradivarius and that kind of ground shouldn't on pedigree pose any problem. Hey, Kelsey, it's Bill Finley. Thanks for joining us. The, the obvious, the storyline is enabled. Can she win for the third time? She didn't win, obviously, in 2019, but won in 2017, 2018. Would be the first time any horse has ever won the arc for three, uh, three times. Could you just reflect on what it will mean if she wins this race and what her place will be in the annals, I guess, not of just the Arc de Triomphe, but of European racing? Yeah, well, if she wins this um, on Sunday, she will be the only horse ever to win this race three times. Um, there have been eight horses to win it twice. Um, but, you know, also the fact that we're seeing her for the fourth consecutive uh, year in this race and she's won twice and been second. I mean, and, and I think we also forget about the fact that like, we refer to her as the, the two time arc winner all the time. But as you know, our American audience knows, she won the Breeders' Cup turf. She won three Oaks races as a three-year-old. She's won three King Georges, which uh, the King George is, um, you know, probably the second most prestigious race in in Europe behind the Arc. Um, she's just, uh, she will absolutely, if she wins this, go down as one of the all-time greats. And, and Kelsey, you know, one of the things that we track here, obviously, are, you know, trainers and, and how many horses they have in certain races. We just talked about, you know, Bafford maybe having the top three horses for the Breeders' Cup Classic. So let's go through the European bend of, of this, where there's, you know, tr about two dozen horses that are still in the running to, to start. And it looks like almost half the field is trained by one of the O'Briens, whether it's Aiden O'Brien or his son, Joseph. So just give us a little background on, on their you know, perceived dominance, it looks like, in, in training titles over in Europe. Yeah, well, um, I think that one of the things that's actually interesting about the arc, which shows just how great and competitive of a race that it is, was that I, I realized this week that Aiden O'Brien has actually only won it twice. <laughs> and, you know, you look at uh, you look at some of those big group ones over there, and he's won eight or ten times, or, or even more than that in some of them. So uh, that just goes to show... Um, what a what a great race it is, and and you know, and the Coolmore team really does love this race, and they throw um, you know a big contingent at it every year. Uh, they have five this year, uh, but it is worth mentioning that the last time um, Aiden O'Brien won it, he did train the first three home, so it's it's certainly not like his record is shabby. <laughs> Kelsey, we've you know this comes up frequently. Phillies seem to do particularly well um, running an open company in Europe, and especially in the Arc. Uh, is it? just a weight thing? What do you make of that? Is it just that they have more opportunities? Um, you know, it seems like they do, Phillies obviously handle open company in Europe uh, a lot better than here. What do you make of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for the ARC, uh, yeah, it is a weight for age race. So um, the, the weight scale in France um, at this time of the year, the, the three-year-old Phillies get um, a, a big weight break for the ARC. So they carry 121 pounds. So that's what enable, um, carried when she won uh, her first arc four years ago. And then um, the three-year-old Colts will carry 125, uh, older mares 128, and then the older horses 131 pounds. So, so it's, a, it's a fairly big scale. Um, and, you know, we're seeing most years, um, we're seeing mares in the race every year, and most years we're seeing one or two of the best three-year-old fillies as well. And a lot of that is also down to the fact that uh, especially at this time of year in Europe there's fewer opportunities at group one level for them over the um the mile and a quarter to a mile and a half so um in in Britain and France both there are only two group one races for older fillies and mares um, which are also open to three-year-olds uh over that distance from the summer onwards and in Ireland, it's only one race. And so on the ARC card, there's there's another race over a mile and a quarter called the Prix de l'Opera. And, uh, but, you know, that's a group one over a mile and a quarter, and it's actually drawn a, a fantastic field this year. But another element is that the purse for that uh, this year is 300,000 euros. The purse for the ARC is 3 million euros. And that's normally 
um, 500,000 and 5 million, but of course with the COVID, um, how, how it's hit purses everywhere has, has hit brands. Um, but yeah, so I think it's a, uh, it's a combination of just, uh, fewer opportunities for them against their own sex and, you know, the, the purse difference as well. And, and then the prestige of it. And like, we regularly also see mares, uh, over in, in Europe running in these big races, like the King George, like I mentioned earlier, uh, will you know, quite often see mares running in that. Uh, it's, it's just, I think, more of a culture over there as well. But some some really fantastic uh, mares on the on the honor roll of this race. Uh, you have likes of Detroit, all along LA France, um, Urban Sea, who incidentally is the dam of uh, both Galileo and Sea the Stars, who both have multiple runners in this year's race. So um, it's got an incredible uh, record for fillies and mares. I wanted to ask about the, the rest of the festival because it isn't just the arc. You mentioned some of the undercard races that'll be going on this weekend. Um, we, I think, I think we've, we've covered the arc for sure, but what else should people like me who tune into European racing every once in a while, what else should I be looking for this weekend in terms of races, but more specifically in terms of horses to watch? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a, it's an incredible day of racing. Um, like this is my favorite day of the year. And the, the most unique thing about this card is that there are, um, there are seven races on the Longchamp card, all group ones. You start with the group one, you end with the group one. Uh, one of those is for Arabians, but six, uh, six group ones for the thoroughbreds. And, um, like I mentioned the Lopera and that's going to be one of the most intriguing races on the undercard for sure. You have uh, two uh, classic winners this year in Europe in Fancy Blue and Peaceful, um, who have who've had a bit of a rivalry going on. And then in that same race, you have uh, Alpine Star, who won the, the Coronation Stakes and was uh, was a really fantastic second against uh, older Colts in the Prix Jacques Moura uh, last out. And um, another one in that race is Tarnawa, who is the filly who beat uh, that filly that I mentioned, Rabaha, uh, last out in the Vermeer. Um, so that's going to be that's going to be a really impressive race. Um, in the Prix de la Bay, uh, which is uh, for five furlong sprinters, you have Batash, who he's almost the uh, the Stradivarius of the sprinters, and that he's won um, almost every major sprinting contest in Europe over the last few years. He's a, he's a gelding, um, and he's going up against uh, the likes of Glass Slippers, who is a filly who won uh, this race, the LeBay, um, last year, and she won the Flying Five Stakes at the Curra last out. Um, so that's going to be uh, that's going to be an interesting uh, matchup as well. Um, in the there's the Prix de la Forêt, which is over seven furlongs, and uh, Earthlight is a very good horse of Godolphin's, who he's a three year old, and and again it's took him a little bit of time to get back to his best this year, but he seems to be you know rounding back out into his good form, um, and he goes up against uh, one Master, who is uh, the Lale Stables, um, you know consistent really good filly over there who's won this race before, uh, so that's going to be an interesting matchup to see as well. Yeah, Kelsey, I just have one more quick question for you. So we just finished up uh, here in the States with um, the Phasic yearling sale, the Keeneland yearling sale. Obviously, there were, you know, 55, 6,000 horses that went through the ring um, over the past couple of weeks. And I know there's a couple of big yearling sales, you know, coming up, um, you know, on the docket over the next week or so. Um, is there anything comparable to, you know, to, to the, the Goffs or the or the uh, Tattersall sale? Is one like Keeneland, one like the Phasic sale or, or, they, or is it? you know, just a, a different system altogether for yearling sales? I would say that the Orby would be more like a uh, Saratoga select sale where it's, uh, it's two days long. It's um, it's Ireland's, you know, select crop of yearlings with some that come over from, from Britain as well. And this year, because of the COVID challenges, the Orby sale is actually being held as we speak at uh, the at Goff's Doncaster sales complex in England. So that would be more, that's a, a, a two day select Saratoga maybe type deal. And then um, Tattersall's is a little bit longer. It has, uh, it has three books starting with the three day book one, which is, it's the best of the best um, cream of the crop in Europe. Like just to go there and see, you know, the pedigrees that are going through, um, you know, interestingly, this year there is a full sister to uh, two horses that are running in the arc. 
So Full Brothers, Japan, and Mogul um, are both running in the arc, and they're full sister cells uh, at Tattersall's next week. So she might be looking at uh, quite an update. Um, and then it leads into, um, you know, book two and in book three after that. Um, so yeah, th those are the two, and, and in, addition, in addition to Arcana's uh, select sale, those are the, you know, select sales of, of Europe. Um, and so I wouldn't say either of them are comparable to the, the, the two week long Keeneland sale, but, uh, but, but definitely, you know, it, all the serious bloodstock uh, folks are in town there uh, looking for their next horses. So Kelsey, obviously travel is tricky this year. What are we, what can we expect from Europeans uh, into the Breeders' Cup? Are there, are have many horses been announced that they're pointing to the race or are we going to have less European? Yeah, I've heard of a few who are, who are planning to come over. Um, you know, one of those being a Godolphin Charlie Appleby horse, um, Pinatubo. Um, but it, the, the travel restrictions certainly um, are likely to cause, uh, you know, some, some maybe issues with people coming over this year. Um, I haven't heard of, of too many, you know, making commitments just yet, but, but it's probably still a little bit early. Um, maybe in the next week or two, once the ARC card is behind, um, we might be hearing um, of some more solid plans. Penitubo's my guy. I hope he comes. Yeah. He's super impressive as a two-year-old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was one of the ones that like really broke through for me. All right. So Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate the insights. Looking forward to the art card and looking forward to having you on in the future to discuss more Euro stuff. And then maybe we'll get you in on a couple American topics as well. We'll be thrilled too. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes as this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Kelsey Riley and her bird, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. So uh, a little bit of action this weekend, more than a little bit for uh, for West Point. They had Hard Not to Love who ran second in the Zenyatta. I assume she's on her way to the Breeders' Cup distaff. They also had a TDN Rising Star on Friday, uh, an opening day at Pimlico, a horse named Jackson Traveler, two-year-old by Munnings, who uh, cruised to a 10-length victory. So definitely one to look to look for in the future. And they also had another maiden winner, Lady Traveler, as well on Sunday at Churchill Down. So big weekend for West Point, big weekend for all the partners. And uh, best of luck th for the rest of the year and in the Breeders' Cup, because I know we'll see you guys there. So the big news this week, or uh, at least some of the big news, we, we, we touched on the, the Haiza Act, as I'm going to call it now, uh, passing through the house. But the other big news was that historical horse racing machines, which have been a huge boon to the Kentucky horse industry, is part of the reason, big part of the reason that you've had these skyrocketing purchases at Churchill Downs, $90,000, $100,000 and up for maiden allowance races. They are now have been declared illegal by the Kentucky Supreme Court. There was a ruling last week. Um, that, that came down on the matter. It would be at the behest of the Kentucky Families Council or whatever the hell their name is. Anytime there's, a, there's families or family in the name of an organization, you know they're trying to screw up your fun, whether it's gambling or what, what, whatever. Anytime you hear that word, just know they're trying to mess with your fun. Um, but yeah, so that that's obviously has a big, big impact on Kentucky purses. I know people in Kentucky are freaking out a little bit about it. Uh, I have some thoughts on the matter and the the... the greater implications of, of how well these machines have done. But uh, I'll toss it to Bill first for his impressions. Well, first of all, as you put into respect, these machines have been wildly successful in the state of Kentucky. And I think two tracks in particular where you can tell the story. Just like you said, Joe, I mean, the purses at Churchill Downs now are astronomical. 
Uh, I think probably they would have the best purses in the country for a, a regular race meet uh, with these $90,000 maidens and whatnot. Uh, the purses were not terrible beforehand, but they got to this level because of historical horse racing machines. The other one is Kentucky Downs, where uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but I, I would gather 90%, 95% of the purses come from their historical horse racing machines. So if you take these away, the impact is going to be severe on the state of Kentucky. So the, the, right now, the story is, as you said, state, state Supreme Court, and, and unanimously at that, 7 nothing declared that they are not legal because they do not fit the uh, definition of paramutual gambling. You cannot have slot machines in Kentucky, so you had this kind of uh, wiggle room to say that they're not slot machines. They are a form of paramutual gambling because you're betting on old horse races. That was approved by the Kentucky Racing Commission. The court now says no thanks. So uh, the question now is what happens from here? And obviously the racing and breeding industries and all the leaders of Kentucky are not going to give up on this. But frankly, as I've been covering this, there's no real obvious path here to getting this change. So it was decided in a Supreme Court, so you can't go to another level of a court. Uh, the highest court in the state has made this ruling. So now what they're trying to do is thinking of maybe getting legislation in the state to either change the definition of paramutual or do something to get these um, machines up and running again. They haven't closed down yet. I'm sure they will within the next couple of weeks. But remember the state you're dealing with here in that it's a very conservative state where religious factions have a lot of power. How many uh, legislators in Kentucky are going to go out and, and ride the bandwagon of pro-gambling? So, you know, if, if this were uh, other states, it probably wouldn't be such a problem. But there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of confidence right now that legislation can be passed to get these machines back going. So, you know, let's hope that there's some sort of 11th hour solution to this or something they can do to get them back. But uh, I, I don't think right now anyone is, is super confident this is going to happen. So uh, will Kentucky racing uh, be able to continue without the machines? Of course, uh, it'll still be great racing. But if you take this purse money away, it's obviously going to be very detrimental to the industry there. And people are rightfully worried. I guess I'd say on the flip side, though, Bill, uh, Kentucky is probably the one state where the racing lobby actually has some power. Um, so I would hope they're able to wield that a little bit. It's certainly scary. Um, I mean, almost every horse we have is based in Kentucky and, you know, I live here and I moved here down here. And of course they cut purses immediately. Um, but yeah, I, I would think, I think something's going to get done. Maybe that's just wishful thinking, but I think there are too, too many people rely on, on uh, racing in this state for it to not, them not to figure out some solution, I hope. I mean, also, Bill, in your story, it also seemed as if Exacta Systems, which is one of the companies that, that runs these machines, has come up with some kind of workaround, maybe. They have like, we're expecting a decision like this. I mean, I guess they put out, uh, and these things get complicated with court definitions and everything, but they think they can uh, create a machine that will adhere to the whatever the court said has to happen for it to be paramutual gambling. Um, you know, I, I don't know anything beyond that. Um, it, it would seem to me that that's kind of a little bit wishful thinking, but you know, it, it's one of more efforts. Everybody's trying their best, be it the, the people that make the machines, be it the people that are in charge of horsemen's groups and industry organizations uh, to, to see what they can do to get this changed. Um, I would guess at the very least, the machines will be shut down at some point in the near future for uh, hopefully a short period of time, but then the, the, the job becomes again to try to get these machines back up and running. And, you know, again, uh, I don't hear a lot of people saying, yes, this is what we're going to do and this is going to work. People are just sort of saying, you know, throwing uh, things up against the wall. We'll try this, we'll try that. And hopefully something will happen. I mean, there's one, there's one takeaway that, that I had and that I have often when it comes to these issues, whether it's subsidies being taken away um, it's like, I feel like there's a crucial fundamental question that we're never asking ourselves, which is why are these other forms of gambling growing while betting on racing is declining? I mean, and instead of relying on alternate gaming revenues, how can we make our core business more attractive to betters? I mean, it's certainly not an easy discussion to have, and I'm not saying there's any easy answers, but if we can somehow solve that problem, we won't have to be constantly playing this game of whack-a-mole where we have to constantly grasp at subsidies or revenue from other avenues before someone inevitably shuts them down and puts the sport on the brink of, of disaster again. Like this is, this is a particularly incredible scenario with the historical horse racing machines because people are literally betting on races that have already happened on a machine instead of live racing often happening right in front of their faces. 
So it's like, how do we get to this point where as an industry, our actual betting product is less popular than a virtual facsimile of it happening like yards away? Like that's, that's the problem to solve long term. And that's kind of, frankly, to me, an embarrassing state of affairs and, and the result of a game that has been marketed really badly for decades now. And, you know, even if Kentucky does get the HHR machines back, which we, we hope they do. And like I said, it sounds like Exacta Systems is coming up with a workaround. Like, how does that at all address the long term viability of our betting product? That's my question. And I think, you know, we kind of miss the forest for the trees when we talk about this stuff because we're just we're just always trying to survive and get this backstop and get this life preserver. And it's it's just we never really address why betting on our sport is going down and we need these alternate sources of revenue. Joe, that's a good point. I want to add something to that. And first of all, um, you're right about exactly what you said. And let's not forget, uh, it's been on the back burner because of COVID. But uh, earlier in the year, we're facing a situation where they're going to take all the slot money out of Pennsylvania racing. And John Green obviously uh, knows what what an impact that would have. It would virtually ruin Pennsylvania racing. Uh, I mean, the feature at Parks, which is now might be $45,000, I think it would be down to 10000 bucks or something like that. So you make a very good point. And, you know, this is maybe a subject for another day because we don't want to go on and on about this. But I, I think one of the biggest problems is sort of the dumbing down of America. People prefer those dumb machines to just sit there like, you know, a zombie and hit that button, hit that button, hit that button, rather than have to use their brain to try to figure out who's going to win a horse race. And I don't know if horse racing can do anything to change that, to be honest. Yeah, Bill, I think you're, you're exactly right. It, it's a it's a microcosm of our society as a whole of what the problem is, um, you know, where everything is going from, you know, a long uh, article that you would read to the USA Today model of a shorter article and pictures down all the way down to now it's 140 characters or less to TikTok, you know, 15 second or less. That that's that's our that's our you know attention span, quite frankly, um, as a society is is dwindling. And I think that's why people like like you said, Bill, to sit mindlessly in front of a machine when there's thoroughbred action going on over your shoulder. And you know, if you go through a lot of these race scenos two thirds of the people in the, in the place don't even know there's horse racing going on, let alone know how to bet on it or what to bet on it. Um, so I, I think you're right. Overall, it's a problem as a society that we're running into um, as to why these machines of previous races are being repackaged and reprocessed. And that's what people prefer. Um, I also think that, that again, I don't want to sound like a, a broken record, but there's also a certain amount of people like to know that there's a quote unquote legitimacy to what they're betting on. And, you know, when, when they look at the racetrack and they see some of the, the trainers that have horses in the race, they say, well, number one, they're prob- that person's probably going to win that race. And if they do, it's probably going to be it's going to pay me two dollars and 30 cents to bet two dollars on. So why would I do that when I can go to a historical machine and every 30 seconds bet on something um, where there's no human element involved in, in, in this, uh, you know, previously recorded product? Yeah, good points, everybody. Um, I mean, we kind of talked about a lot of these issues with gambling and making betting more friendly, uh, I guess over the last few months, but I mean, like Joe said, this is kind of it all coming home to roost a little bit. Yeah. I mean, and I, th- I think Bill's point and Bill and John's point is, is right about the dumbing down of, of America. I think that our attention spans are getting shorter. It's more of a cerebral game. So it becomes a tougher sell as time goes on. But I, I just don't want that to be the, the lone explanation for why our revenues are declining. I think that's kind of, a little bit, a little bit of, of a scapegoat when I think the the, the game itself has not been marketed well. Um, takeout is too high. We don't market contests like I, there, there should be like on every single broadcast of racing. And now obviously the people in racing don't have control over every single broadcast, but there should be some kind of contest where they're like they're filming people. Um, like I remember that show Horse Players was was really good where they followed the, sh- the players throughout the year and then eventually ended up at the Breeders' Cup betting challenge. They gave you a reason to care about the races that you wouldn't normally have. And, you know, I just, I think they've, they've done a little bit more of the, the gambling focus on the NBC broadcast with Eddie Olchek. But overall, it's like it's it's really more fluff than anything. And I don't I still think racing has, has marketed the, the, the wins well. They, they have not dropped takeout, and they haven't embraced tournament play, which I think is, is a new avenue to get new horse players in who may not 
you know, understand the, the, the vagaries of pick fives and pick fours and trifectas and superfectas right away. This is something that you can understand because, you know, it, it's a little bit of an allegory to the, to the World Series of Poker which is so popular and poker is boring as hell, but they, they market the personalities, they market the purses and they market this big event, you know, as a, as a way to, to tune in and get familiar with the sport. And I just don't, I don't see that. I don't see racing doing that. And I think, you know, to constantly be, like I said, to, to constantly be trying to latch on to these other revenues that do not have to do with your core business, or in this case, do have to do with your core business, but are races from the past that people would rather bet on because it's easier and because they have no entree into your sport. Like, I think that that's the core issue to address long term. And it's not easy. I'm not saying there's an easy answer, but, you know, it's, you know, we, we like I said, we kind of miss the forest for the trees and we, we kind of are, are looking for other solutions when we don't solve the core problem in the sport, which is declining betting revenue. Um, but yeah, so hopefully we get these H HR machines back in Kentucky. Like I don't, nobody wants to see like Kentucky purses go down or struggle. It is, it is the, like the bedrock state in our country in terms of racing. So, you know, obviously not, a, not a good state of affairs right now, but I think there's, there's a broader discussion to be had about stuff like that and the subsidies and what we can do to kind of offset some of them being taken away sometimes, because now we're just, we're really relying on governments and courts and to not take our candy away. And we just, we, we haven't, we haven't addressed the fundamental issues. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. So that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, the Keeneland Fall Meet starts this Friday, October 2nd. Make sure to wager with Keeneland Select and get those bonuses that I mentioned in the open. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Brian DiDonato, all the dogs that chimed in throughout the show with their opinions, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Nathan Wilkinson and Danny Seiper, our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the Preakness and the Ark. Wear a mask. See you next week.